the beginning was very important, you know, we, the altars and how to make altars, the ofrendas, the offerings. But it, it evolves, you know, we used to use slide projectors. Uh, the technology has changed. We use some of the uh, computers to, to do PowerPoint presentations. Um, so that that has changed. Also, uh, the inclusiveness to me is is very important. Um, I remember when I was at the Mission Cultural Center and they were doing the eight quilts and the uh, eight quilt project lent us uh, four quilts, and um, I saw the importance of that project because being at the Mission Cultural Center and explaining to people, and this is um, back in the 80s, but explain to the mission community uh, and uh, to some conservative people about compassion, AIDS, the medicine, all that was, was so important that I saw that people uh, having their minds turned around understanding what the problem was. And so certain things that uh, uh, I thought um, it was taking it to a different place in the discussion and the context. So to me, those things are important. And in the procession, uh, I remember I put together a contingent in the beginning, contingent uh, of people. And uh, back, back then, you know, um, uh, there wasn't, uh, the, they hadn't perfected the medicine for AIDS, so people are dying. And uh, so we put this together, this contingent of uh, people with AIDS to inform people. So those, those things to me are somewhat important because uh, it does resonate and it does bring questions. Uh, Javier Rocabado, He's got a, an installation and in his medicine bottles, he puts a, a simulated uh, cocaine because the AIDS medicine keeps going up and the pharmaceuticals are becoming like drug dealers. You know, here's, <laughs> this costs so much, but tomorrow is gonna cost so much. And I see this happening. Uh, my partner has cancer and um, her medicines keep going up. You know, it's sold for profit. Uh, and it just, um, well, you know, some people can go to Mexico or Canada and get them for like a tenth of what they're worth. So uh, things like that raises questions that are, that are important. Uh, there's an artist too in, in, that has missing women from, uh, from El Salvador, Mexico, the femicide that's happening in Juarez. Those, those are issues that people should talk about and we bring stu students through and, and it's important. This is something too that we have a tradition of bringing in students and, and dealing with uh, hard subjects. Um, so it, to me, those, those things have changed throughout the years. It has brought up political issues uh, and how how we deal with them and how they affect us, uh, our spiritual being, you know, certain things that when you question why is this happening or, um, and last year it was, uh, uh, we had an installation about Ferguson and uh, that, that came into the conversation and back then we also talked about Black Lives Matter and this year too we are talking about Black Slide Matter and, and um, how it has affected us as a country. Because um, I just, uh, and I'm hoping to bring that up with, with the students because we're, we're in a time where uh, we're in very Trumpy times. This, um, Donald Trump is spewing all this hate and racial uh, disparity and um, and all the Republicans are going along with it. So it's, it's how it, it affects us um, as a country. So you've got to bring up 
there's political issues, uh, and there's political issues that I feel we're bringing up are, are spiritual issues too. They're they're connected. When I first started doing this and started going towards the political, um, I started seeing that it made a difference in, in people's dialogue and and uh, and the text. Uh, I, th I think it was also putting out the text of these altars. Um, so I, I I like that mixture, diversity, stirring it up. Um, and I know that people have come up to me and said, oh, it's not traditional, it's, it's not Mexican, uh, it's not pure, but it's all hybrid. Even, you know, in the Oakland Museum, you know, quote, pure exhibit, it's all hybrid. You know, uh, once you cross a border and you start, um, developing in your mind what something is, identity, uh, religion, spirituality, all those different elements. But I like to throw them and create this hybrid thing that happens. Uh, and that's, uh, that's another uh, delight when, when the hybridity comes to light. And I see now that's, you know, like, uh, Tanya Figueroa and uh, Howie Katz, I mean, working together, they're a couple, and they're working together. What comes out is, it's, it's uh, amazing. Um, and, but a very hybrid, very, very tech. Um, so I keep, I keep that in, in mind, that uh, the hybridity of it. And uh, part of it comes, from technology to education to um, how people will take a paper cut and create something new, a different, or take a paper flower and create a, a, a new type of different day of the dead paper flower. That's, I, I pay attention to that. I'm, a, I'm a, like an anthropologist. I, I make notes. And the ofrendas, you know, ofrendas, uh, in Mexico, people go to the cemetery, they clean up the grave, they make offerings. If it's a child, they offer toys and candy. Or if it's older, they put a bottle of liquor or they pour some on the grave they put, and cigarettes uh, that they liked. But, you know, and it, it, the offerings, um, ofrendas, um, 
some of them are like space age ofrendas that we have. Uh, and uh, I love seeing that actually, uh, because it's uh, somebody's interpretation of what an offering is and, and how they shape it and how they, um, they make it. I, I could point some out to you that, uh, but to me that's being hybrid and a whole lot of levels, you know, it's like when I see a painting and it's layered, I really appreciate it because it has a lot of different levels. So the same thing with um, installations that people come up with different ideas of how to present, how to honor somebody. And um, that to me, you know, like John Miro for the kids of the world, the victims of war and all that. She has toys. So the kids come and they trip out on the toys, but then they start looking at the pictures of the other children and they're like them. And it starts making them think. And to me, that's uh, when I see that, that uh, it gets me very excited that these kids are thinking and they're looking and they're processing. In the beginning, you know, in the 70s, uh, we were demonized. There used to be this uh, Irish policeman in the, in the mission station, and uh, he thought we were a death cult. And when I asked for a permit to do a, a procession, he, he, he thought it was a Satanist. Uh, I was a Satanist. So there's a lot of uh, cultural miscommunication. And it was through the kids that it spread, through the students that spread more of an understanding. But I, I did like the, that we started with something, with a table and two candles and a picture and flowers to, you know, this temple that Victor Mario does, you know, big temple. Uh, it's, you know, I remember, the, you know, the whole process um, and, and how you know we people would come and sit down and work the process through them when they wanted to do something and they wanted to understand um, and then other other people coming and seeing skulls and um, and their only reference was Halloween that it was spooky, but this is more spiritual this is more. Uh, it, it, it's not Halloween because uh, a lot of people that walk in or they go to open studios, oh, Halloween, you know, uh, trick or treat. You know, people tell me trick or treat. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it, it's very different from that. Um, but from my impressions of Mexico and talking to Ralph Maradiaga, and but partly we said, you know, we want to introduce ritual to this community, yes, some sort of rituals and ceremony and spirituality to really engage the community. And, um, and I think it's, it's worked and it's spread, uh, spread throughout the United States. Uh, so to me, that's, that's, uh, that's something that I'm kind of proud of.
I would take myself kind of out of my comfort zone for this show because of the nature of it and kind of combine two things. So I've written um, some poems to share with you and these are the accompanying photos. This is three haikus for my city. There is something sweet about the crying I do when our shoulders touch. Amidst loss and lust, we sank under Mission Creek and shared rescue breaths. Under the harsh weight of your tattered navy sea coat, we broke like chopsticks. This is called All of My Play Cousins Are Dead. It's a pantoum to all of the people I've had to bury too early. All of my play cousins are dead, dozing with nightmares of cop cars zooming under their beds, sweating red through plain tees and hometown jerseys, fever dreams of stop and frisk or suspicious activities. Growing up black and brown spun each of their lives into malicious realities made them hashtags, t-shirt images, and biased news stories, dozing with nightmares of cop cars zooming under their beds. There's only two ways to leave the hood. You either get rich or you die. Made them hashtags, shirt images, and biased news stories as I sit at memorials learning new ways to grieve. There's only two ways to leave the hood. You either get rich or you die. Growing up black and brown, spun each of their lives into malicious realities. As I sit at memorials, learning new ways to grieve, all of my play cousins are dead. This is called A Four-Part Reflection on Gentrifuckers, Surviving Epidemics, and Being a Functional Stoner. Escape. When I was born, I was so small I had to wear goggles to keep my eyes from falling out of my skull. Although a doctor would probably tell you it was my premature birth or the heroin coursing through my four pound body, I'm here to tell you it's because even at birth, I wasn't ready to see what the world had in store for me. Examine. 27 years after that fateful 420, my joints, green and bone white, twist and contort whenever they are rolled. My lungs, filled with both smoke and black mold because I sleep in the eye of the storm, just a, th a stone's throw from Sansuji Creek. Penetrate. My struggle to fit into skinny jeans because my Obachan thinks I'm too skinny. My Tio is teaching me about clean bulking, and the Palestinian man at my corner store always hooks it up with the about to expire gluten free TV dinners because my failure to procure $15 for a burger and fries in some new neighborhood that doesn't even really have a name yet does not go unrecognized by him. Sometimes I can feel the ground beneath me, labored and scared just like me, as I walk past condos, my stomach growls for a plate which is not meant for me, postulate. I would like to say this is a new sensation, but it feels far too familiar. The trauma of watching this, you know, my, my village is burning, my people are hurting, one of the Nuevo gentricide, property and land damage. Cultural massacres occur and it, it's not a new vision, it's been, gathered from the embers of an ancestor, and it, and it will not pass until each cell in my pulga-shaped body has been picked off by colonizers who've just replaced de blooms with dot-coms, communities with commodities, horses with fixies, and the ships with cranes to build condos with different expressions for the same oppression in an attempt to make anyone who's been rooted here feel happy about the smallpox blankets they will soon be offering us. This is called on walking with women of color who stare at their feet when they're alone. One, for a couple decades and two separate centuries, I stood with a slouch, my hunched frame so calcified, no amount of therapy or desist assistive devices could unroll the coil of my mom's attempt at social wiring. It took 27 years for my self-generated manhood to help me stand upright. You see, my bad posturing isn't easily corrected because it wasn't birthed from genetics, accident, or injury. I was bent from the tra trauma of impersonating a woman in a world that hisses, you are dispensable. Too big, too hairy, too dark, too crazy, too angry, too chaste, too slutty, too poor, too outspoken. Two, this is for the bent bodies of women of color. From my pala mestiza prima to my Pepsi skin Nigerian sister. For the cunts that no cat collar could colonize. 
for the women who sleep in silk head wraps with glowing Jesus portraits swirling above their beds. This is an ode to our shells, the sisterly slouch. Us baby girls who smell of pink hair lotion and dulces. It is for you, my other selves, my former selves. I stand the tallest today, head high, bird-like, chest sticking out, a fist ball to slug any and all men who dare to get too close to either of us. Three. For years I tried to find the balance between two spirits in me, but as tender men tend to be, I was foolishly hearted. And the gaze of men, the envy of women, and media depictions of my sisters were strong enough to fold me like origami time and time again. Because from the time I was old enough to lose my baby teeth, men felt compelled to pursue me. Women felt the need to poke and prod at parts of my body they coveted, or to scrap, rich, choke, trip, bite what they didn't like out of me. They felt the need to fold me up, Ironically, the same men who used to chase me now clear sidewalks for me. The same concrete they used to corner me on now divides our masculinity. The same women who used to envy my hair now clutch their purses when I smile on the street. Or the girls who jump me in playgrounds or at the bus stops now want me to be their gay best friend. Four, today I'm following whom I believe to be as the first man to ever try to put his hands on me without my consent. The only weapon I am armed with is a camera, so I aim the barrel at him pausing only to notice how he is slouching. And in a cruel twist of fate, I am the man with the power and no longer a hunched over little girl. This time it is he who is prey. Got one more for you. My hands didn't always shake. In fact, for years they would lock in place, too rigid to bend or flex, too strong to stop muscle contractions from occurring, but I, like so many others before and after me, could not be saved from the hands of the police for daring to live black and brave on open waters. With one question, what business do you have with that woman? My life was put on pause. No rewind, no fast forward, the only playback option being a loop of the destruction. This all happened at 21. 21 when we're all supposed to grow up in some sort of way, but I grew out instead. Freshly adulted, I had just begun to hone my craft as a photographer making waves in an industry dominated by white men who were being forced to respect my big, fat, black, weirdo ass. I was setting sail on an epic adventure, right as the SFPD saw fit to give me a case of CPTSD when they purposely capsized my boat, tossed away my life preserve, and stopped me from traveling any further. The officer that held me so tight I had bruises for five days after saw fit to rip a hole through the sail of my arm, and thus down I went. Friends and family sent out a search party, but I was too far out to see to see, brain damage from water inhalation, body fatigue from trying to swim home to a shanty that had been blown away. Here I sink, submerged under trauma and physical mutations, tangled below sea level, coming up for air as often as I can, but mostly singing, swinging casually from a very loose, kelp-tied noose at the hands of an officer, never to shoot either of us with a steady hand again. Thank you. I'll never know my father as a man. I'll always see him through the kaleidoscope lens through which all boys see the world. Flashes of color and a mosaic print built for monuments, my father was a god. An Apollo spirit with a Zeus appetite, he moved mountains with his guitar pick poured rivers with his tipping vodka bottles, dragged suns along his cigarettes, and spun the earth on the tip of his pool stick. His music, so wild I could hear it in my mother's voice as she threw her car keys at him yelling, you good for nothing son of a bitch. And he flew like Hermes to the car, wings tied to his ankles with guitar strings, dodging blow dryers and anything she could grab as he slipped through her fingers like the smoke from his parted lips. They say no man can view God in all his glory. So maybe that's why I never saw him much. But there aren't enough rocks in Zion for me to stand on waiting for him to bust through the front door. Honey, I'm home. 
doesn't have the same ring to it when it's slurred and unappreciated. Your eyes don't shine as bright when they're dilated. Your hugs aren't as tight when your heart fights to keep beating. But I gotta hand it to you. You were slick. That kind of, what are you doing with a loser like him? Kind of slick. That, now this is how you talk to a lady. Kind of slick. That sting to your breath. That smoke on your leather jacket. That can't read a measure of sheet music, but can play Eric Clapton like Eric Clapton can't. Kind of slick. That kind of slick that sends men slipping on liquor-stained lips towards shackled chain trips to places no child should have to visit. It's funny how mothers come up with the most playful names for jail. The pokey, she said, and to me, it was a corrupt prison for revolutionaries and my dad, a cowboy. Guns blazing, spitting tobacco, and clicking his stirrups as he planned his great escape. Maybe he'd bust out on horseback, riding the fastest Arabian stallion, galloping to the beat of my pulse, running like he had something to live for. Or maybe he was undercover. Yeah, that's it. He wanted in, so that son of a bitch who really stole mom's car would pay. What a hero. She loved you, you know. That kind of, you could sell me the Brooklyn Bridge kind of love. That hot air balloon weddings over the river banks kind of love. That no one can make me do the crazy things you can kind of love. That Icarus's wax wings kind of love. That moth to a flame kind of love. That take my keys, my car, my soul, and my salvation kind of love. That kind of love that lifts you so high. You forget the warmth of the earth between your toes, get lost in the ether and need a 12 step down kind of love. She should curse your name. Lock it away in a box, chained with the shaking fingers. She ran through your cold hair pleading, come by the shop and I'll cut it for you, please. Just let me cut your hair for you one more time. You know, there comes a day when fathers put down their sons and never pick them up again. But there are no funerals for the passing of their purity. No dirges for the loss of their eternity. A little boy died that day and you forgot to cry for him, but he cried for you. He spent the next 10 years holding his breath through every tunnel and wishing on every star till the galaxies ran dry with nothing but unanswered prayers to fuel his fire. And that blurred light pierced his squinted eyes, grabbed a hold of his spirit, pulled it from his six foot four frame and it stood before him looking a lot like you. So please, please don't misread my reveries for bitterness, my perceptions for disappointment or my reflection for condemnation, you see. You still exist in the vapor trails left by the planes you so love to stare up at. And every time I see them take off, I fly right up to you. And there will come a day when we'll meet again and I'll smile. And maybe then I'll have the courage to tell you that what we have is beautiful. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this poem is for anyone who's ever felt uncomfortable in your own skin or your body. After the witches went up in flames, 
We inhaled the fumes of their ashes and spit out their magic, the taste of blood on our tongues. Oh, to be the hunters and not the hunted ones, the way your ass looks in those jeans, the way your nipples poke through your shirt. In Brooklyn, the men go crazy in the summertime. All those summer dresses and short skirts and cold beers at the bodega, cop car windows rolled down halfway. They asked Amber why she waited three days to report it to the police. Didn't she realize that he could be anywhere by now? And really, how did she know he was trying to rape her? How did she know for sure he had a gun when it could have been any hard metal object digging into her neck, her face pressed up against a brick wall in those final moments before she slithered out of his grasp? How did she know? There's no shame in running from a monster, but these legs do tire. They'll say we asked for it, all those summer dresses and short skirts, and how come we can't just take a compliment like a good girl? Why can't we just swallow their words and not spit them out right back? Sometimes I do mistake the sour taste of oppression for flattery, especially on those days when my body hangs heavier in the air listening to goddesses talk scalpels and belly fat over barely forked over dinner plates. I've imagined all the ways that flesh could leave a bone, ripping pores open like virgins to the tip of a knife, imagining a perfect plastic me, immune to the toxins that pollute these earthly streets. There's a lot of money to be made off of our pain. I wanna tell you what the elders tell me, sitting across from my mother in our favorite breakfast spot, huevos rancheros gushing with salsa verde, twirling yolk and melted queso around my fork. The tech workers at the table next to ours proclaim, we're gonna try every dirty Mexican restaurant in the mission. The line cuts through the air like a shark through water. My mom notices the expression on my face change from curiosity to contempt. She is wiser than me. Ignorance rolls off her back like river water against a rock that has been smoothed by many currents. Let it go, she says. My mother is infinitely more diplomatic than I am. Maybe things aren't so black and white. After all, a white looking girl can come out of a brown vagina. I hold my mug of cafe con leche to my lips, look around the room and feel that we are alone here. The city is filled with ghosts a palpable ancestral fog that rolls in and out like construction equipment. In San Francisco, empty skeletons of houses sit side by side with the shells of shiny new ones. New neighborhoods, fit, new neighbors fitting lock to key, keeping their heads down, ensuring the front gate shuts completely behind them as they sift the mail and discard messages left for people who will never read them. I wanna tell you what the ancestors tell me that there is no turning back from the ledge, only knowing you will fly when you don't. Gathered around the embers, sisters touching flames to our wounded skin, sealing scars like puckered lips kissing our struggles. Even as they tie rope around our wrists, we bear witness to our own majesty. Freedom is a story we tell in the dark. Smoke rising, buried in mud, for this bitter earth will survive us as we have survived it. Thank you. selected entirely from the Library of Congress. All the images were shot between 1890 and 1910, the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century. And I feel like this was um, a very poignant time in history. Um, 
sort of a goodbye to the old world. And people had a lot of hope and imagination about what was to come. Um, I don't think they had any idea about <laughs> how much things would change. And I chose clips that I felt had some sort of life force or where people were really present and in the moment. Um, the song that we're going to play was inspired by a sense of temporariness in the world and how everything changes. Uh, there's a lot of loss and yet many things stay the same. And so um, all we can really do when we try to contemplate this because it has such an impact on the human psyche is to be in this moment. And this song was called Dance, Little Girl. Day by day. 
First is medicine learned through tradition, making prayer ties with offerings and intentions wrapped inside, the burning of sage, sweet grass, and kapal, crawling into sweat lodge and joining father, uncle, and siblings in the circle, singing behind the drummers during powwows, secretly wishing I could drum, ceremony practice on mountain tops at dawn wrapped in old blankets, repeating the old stories quietly while falling asleep. First is medicine through tradition, creating altars for the dead, kneeling before candlelight in wooden churches, quiet meditation, and long prayers of the rosary. Then is when medicine is needed, when brother overdoses in an empty field, when the past comes to me in dreams, when skinwalkers haunt, when we feel we can't go on, when I learn of my parents' trauma and I realize why I endured my own. Medicine is needed when speaking to parents after their native daughters have taken their own lives in bedroom closets and on the flight to childhood homes from a place I thought would be forever home. Medicine is needed after a visit to the abortion clinic or after doctor's visits that result in bad news. Medicine is needed on dark mornings after long fights with partner, after unexpected passings, when grandma says, these kinds of things happen to all Indian girls. Medicine is needed when commitment is as frightening as it is exciting, when the sun doesn't come out tomorrow, and when we feel abandoned by each other. And in time with friendship, we find medicine in the living and in each other. I find, I find medicine in you. Chakta mix muhed, soul family to this chicana. I find medicine in your hands, tracing through my hair, stopping tears as I cry in the street. We stand in prayer ties as we stand in friendship, witness to each other's joyous and grief-filled moments, and find medicine here. In this circle, blessed on this stage and in this lifetime, My mother's shadow box. Shelburne Falls is a little town in western Mass, partially hydro-powered by a dammed waterfall. It's where I spent my toddler and preschool years with gypsies and derelicts, flirting with floral skirts and grease-laden men who don suspenders and muscle t-shirts. One day my mother gathered the nets we used to organize our monarchs when they hatched from little green chrysalides. We walked the bridge of flowers, passing over the town dam. Rosy-cheeked and excited, I caught four. My mother walked me home as I held the jar, forgetting my feet and peering in as they scrambled against their entombment. The wings were iridescent in places and powdery in others. The colors were metallic in the light. At home, she rolled a joint and smoked it in the rocking chair in the corner. A haze filled the room that it so bright it accentuated setting sunbeams pressing through the blinds like dusty two by fours. The wings slowed, their shades fading down like autumn leaves. The evening wore and my mother pulled out a bag of cotton balls and a strange foul smelling bottle of liquid. She put the jar on the coffee table. The butterflies woke and fluttered with a blush of new hope. She put the liquid on a couple of cotton balls and opened the jar lid just enough to drop them inside. Falling and slipping down the glass, the wings heaved and then glinted and eventually pressed up and together like hands in prayer. I don't know how much I asked or even if I knew how to ask about what was going on, but I remember how hard my heart raced and how I knelt on the rug wide-eyed, gripping the wooden table, knowing I could never get them back. Long after she was finished, I sat staring at the duller underside of their canvases, wondering if their paint was forever buried within. Before bed, she wrenched their velvety wings back open. She glued them in the places where the violence showed through, and she pinned them on satin-covered foam and slid them in a glass box to hang above the sofa. 
an emblem of the first time I would witness death and the ache I learned to write by. Our parents, Peter and Via, met at a conference in Seattle, Washington in 1978. They lived 3,000 miles apart. She was in Massachusetts and he was in California. And so their relationship had, was a long distance relationship at the start. She had a radio show and one day she recorded a song for him and she sent it in the mail. I don't know if it was a cassette or what were those things? <laughs> Real to real. Real to real. To real. Um, he hadn't heard this song before, but he loved it and it became theirs. The song was Forever Young by Bob Dylan. So no one knew then that he would pass away at 49 years old after almost 20 years together. Earlier this year, my mom told me the story. I'd never heard it before. And she shared the song with me, and I actually had also never heard the song before. As she shared it, she was crying and she dared to ask whether the song had been a curse or a premonition. No, I told her, if anything, it was a connection. It was a beautiful projection prayer that you gave to him to see him beyond the 20 years that you shared. So tonight we're going to sing Forever Young. We invite you to sing the bolded chorus and the third verse with us. So if you want to get out your um, programs right now to sing along with us. We invite you to join us in singing your own protection prayer mm -hmm. so you can have someone in mind or uh, just be singing for your loved ones. After all, life is fleeting, but love endures beyond. 